This is a production of Cornell University. My name is Zachary Stansel, and I am the hemp curator at the USDA Agricultural Research Service. Um, so the work that we do in our laboratory is to create a seed library for genetically diverse hemp varieties from all around the world. Um, additionally, we are going to be studying all of those diverse and unique varieties of hemp for um, all kinds of different traits that um, plant breeders, farmers, and during the course of the last couple of years that we've started this project, we've had just the tremendous honor of meeting, learning from, and collaborating with some of the most dynamic and influential scientists, entrepreneurs, and experts in the hemp world. Um, so we are thrilled to share some of that knowledge that we've gained in that process with all of y'all. Um, so I really want to thank um, Cornell University for uh, co-partnering with us to make this seminar, hemp webinar series. Um, George. And I want to give my biggest shout out to all of our friends um, uh, at our HBCU institution. So we've been thrilled to see how um, these HBCU hemp programs are just emerging as real powerhouses. So we wanted to make sure that um, y'all were invited to the to the to the party, and uh, we're just so thrilled to have everyone here. Um, so I, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Um, so Dr. Bruce Bugby is a professor at Utah State University and the president of Apogee Instruments. So he has a very illustrious background. He's collaborated with NASA for 40 years to design food production systems for people living on Mars. Um, in 2011, he was awarded the Governor's Medal for Science and is a fellow of both the American Society of Agronomy and American Society of Horticulture. Um, he has recorded multiple videos on photobiological principles. Uh, one video on cannabis has over 2 million views. Um, so one might argue that uh, his pinnacle achievement is summarizing um, so much of this information in a TED talk called Turning Water into Food. So after Bruce's uh, talk, we are going to have a Q and uh, Q and A session. So we're start thinking of some great questions to stump him. I'm Bruce Bugbee, and I'm pleased to be giving this talk today in the USDA Cornell Hemp Seminar uh, on indoor production. Now you just heard previously on outdoor production. We're going to go indoors. The first thing I want to say is. When we grow low THC compounds, the current value rarely justifies indoor production. But there's a lot of other things that are high value that do justify it. And we this is our, the core of our studies. And when we say hemp, in our case, we're always talking about medical hemp grown for the highest value, direct consumption by people. So, uh, it, it can get pretty valuable. Let me start with a little diagram here. When we say indoor, what does that mean? Well, to a lot of people, it means no sunlight. It means a electric lights in a closed warehouse in a closed room. And I'm going to put that over here. Here's our box. And I, and I guess I could put some green plants in here too, inside the box. And then, since we're on a roll, Here's the sun, get the sun anatomically correct here. There's no sun in here. All of this is driven by electricity. It's very expensive to replicate sun compared to over here, a greenhouse. And now we put the sun in this. And of course, the sun goes right in, free sunlight. I've given several seminars on this, most recently one last October at Cornell University 
And the title of that seminar was The Physics of Farming Without Sunlight. It's recorded, you can look that up online. It was part of the Horticulture Department seminar series. And I talked about this trade-off between farming without sunlight and greenhouses. And if you listen to my seminars, you'll know that I'm a huge proponent of greenhouses because we get free sunlight. This is high-tech greenhouses. So I should mention that these are closed air-conditioned greenhouses in which we elevate CO2. So now both of these have high CO2, they're life in the fast lane, really fast plant growth. It's just that this one uses free sunlight and it uses a lot less fossil fuels. So the future of this I think is going to be high-tech greenhouses. Both are indoors and everything <coughs> I'm going to talk about is relevant to both. Both of them use supplemental lighting, especially in the winter, now from LEDs. Uh, this has the great advantage of some real high-tech glass. Not real high-tech, you buy it commercially, but it reflects thermal infrared radiation from the sun, so it's much easier to air condition greenhouses now than it used to be. And when they air condition them, we control humidity and we can elevate CO2, so these are similar. All right, there's the whole talk, indoor production, two things, but everything I say is relevant to both. The, now, let's take a look at what I call the nine cardinal parameters for growth. I've shown this slide several times and, and other people have used it, uh, so it's, it's worth going through this again. When we go inside, we control all of these parameters. And uh, the, of significance is CO2. We elevate CO2, that enhances photosynthesis 30%, maybe even 40%. It, it allows us to use a higher temperature when we elevate CO2 because of photorespiration. It's a huge difference with indoor. Also, we put light up here, control the light. Unlike outside, the sun comes up in the morning and we, get, we can't control whether it's cloudy or not. We can control when we plant, when we harvest. Indoors, we have a huge control of light. With LEDs, I'm going to talk about LEDs in a minute, we can turn up the LEDs and really increase the light and wow, cannabis is an absolutely high light crop. It's like some race car that you can drive 400 miles an hour if you can pour enough light in. But when you put all that light in, the transpiration rate goes up. So you need more water. You need more water, you need more nutrients. Respiration in the root zone goes up. You need more oxygen. The, the optimum temperature is higher. You need more wind blowing through the crop to help cool it. Light drives everything. It's a huge factor. And, and in this lab, we've spent a lot of time studying light. So that's a concept of all the things you can do with indoor production to elevate yield. There's our expensive inputs, particularly the light. But when the product is high value, all of this is economically justified. We have been studying in this lab medical hemp, which we also call low THC cannabis. It's all cannabis sativa, the same genus and species. The low THC is what's federally legal now, and that's the crop that we're studying at, at universities. That's in contrast to high THC cannabis that is psychoactive, but federally illegal. So all of our, our licenses for low THC, when I say cannabis, I'm always referring to the low THC type, which has earned the nickname hemp. But hemp is for, often for rope and for clothes. So then we say medical hemp, because this is grown for pharmaceuticals, not for seed and fiber. This is such a big thing that last year, we developed and taught an online course in 
the science and technology of medical cannabis cultivation. Note capital C italicized, that's the name of the genus. Um, this is the page, it's at cannabis.usu.edu. This course is, we got a lot of students, this course is now closed, it's done, but as we speak, we're working on a second addition to this course and it'll be posted here. But this website gives you a, a more in-depth view of some of the things I'm gonna talk about here. Let's talk about LEDs. This is a real breakthrough and it's facilitated a massive amount of supplemental lighting for crops to push the growth. This is a curve over the last 20 years of LEDs and the electrical efficiency, it's gone from 10%, here we are, 2022, right up here. Now, how does this compare for other lighting technologies? Before this, we used high pressure sodium, which is about 35% efficient, and you can see roughly 2010 LEDs caught up and passed high pressure sodium, and fluorescent is in the teens for efficiency down in here. So this gives you some sense of how good LEDs really are, but it also gives you a sense of where we're going. 100% is a theoretical max. We're never gonna quite get there, but this is our prediction. So we're close to where we're gonna get with LEDs. What's changing about LEDs is price, reliability, um, those kinds of factors the ability to get the lights consistently up to 80% efficient. This is just remarkable. Consider that this 20% here is still heat. People say LEDs don't put off any heat. Yeah, if you're an instrument manufacturer, you put them in, they get plenty hot, even with 20%. So, but they're a, they're a wonderful technology. They allow us to do all kinds of amazing things with colors of light, and, and I'm gonna show you some of those things right now. Spectral effects on photosynthesis. I love this dark side of the moon, prism, breaking light up into colors. For the first time ever, we can pinpoint these colors and, and re really study their effects on plants. It's fascinating what they can do, and our recent research in this lab has helped us see some things that we, we could not have studied without LEDs. Here's the, a big one. Far red photons are these photons right here. I should draw that in red, deep red, the photons right here. They're right at the edge of our vision. Far red photons are like a red hot burner on a stove. Hard to read a book by them, but, but they're there. They're abundant in sunlight, and now we have a very, very efficient far-red LED. Historically, we have said those are not photosynthetic. They cause shade avoidance responses. They don't cause photosynthesis. We revisited that idea. We have been revisiting it over the past several years, and I'm pleased to report that we are proposing a new definition of photosynthetic photons. This work was the result of Xu Yang Zhen, who was a postdoc with us for several years now. She's assistant professor at Texas A&M. She's still working on this. And also Mark Van Eersel, who was a postdoc in this lab like a long time ago. I forget, 20, 30 years ago. Now he's a distinguished professor at the University of Georgia. We are still collaborating on this work. And to tell you how the circles that we go in, Xu Yang got her PhD with Mark Van Ersel, and she came here to do photosynthesis research. Here's the paper that summarizes all this, just published last year, why far red photons should be included in the definition of photosynthetic radiation. This is a review paper but co-authored by all of us. Um, this is pretty in-depth, but it's, it's fascinating because I want to share the excitement of research with you. This is a huge finding for all of biology. Look at what these colors do. This is a leaf, and we'll put the leaf in green. 
on here. Here's the bottom of the leaf, here's the top. Blue and red photons are quickly absorbed in the top of the leaf. They're very efficiently absorbed, but they don't penetrate. They're so efficiently absorbed, whereas the green photons penetrate deep into the leaf. And when you get another leaf down here, they keep going. They keep penetrating into the canopy. So green photons are, the value of green is underrated. Look at far red. These also penetrate deep in the leaf. This is one of the reasons that these photons are so good. This, let's get rid of that. This is, there's two papers. You can pause this and see these papers, but two papers on the value of these far red photons um, for photosynthesis. And far red's almost like a blowtorch. It's a real powerful wavelength that now we can now add and subtract when we do electric lights in greenhouses. Summary of spectral effects. I'm taking a dozen lectures and compressing them into minutes. This is helped out by Paul Kasuma, a recent PhD student in the lab. He's now research scientist at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Um, but he helped us out a lot during, during his PhD year. Let's take these five categories of light and go through them. UV induces photoprotective pigments in plants, and some of those photoprotective pigments could be cannabinoids, because they absorb UV light. UV light turns green lettuce red, that's anthocyanin. Um, I will say that we don't have any evidence from multiple studies in this lab that more UV can trigger cannabinoid synthesis, even though people think that it does, and our results are now consistent with other labs on that. Blue inhibits cell expansion. This is a, if you wanna keep plants small and short, you can do it with blue, and I think I have a picture, here's cannabis, 30% blue, 5% blue, look at that difference in height. You can shrink the plants make them compact with blue light. When you do that, you have to plant at a higher density, but these are all trade-offs with uh, manipulating the shape. Green is key because it facilitates human vision. Here's some blue lights, blue and red. You can't, the plants look black. There's the green photons, beautiful plants, example of how critical green light is. We used to grow plants under purple light blue and red, and now that's so difficult that we now add white LEDs to fixtures so we can see the plants. I think I have another picture here. This is cannabis under a high pressure sodium light and under some LEDs, and you can see the difference in color here. These are just look more natural. The growth was the same. It didn't matter, but in this study, we got some spider mites, a microscopic insect. We couldn't see those on the high pressure sodium lights, but here in the LEDs with a better color rendering index, we could find the insects. We can also diagnose nutritional disorders. So the bottom line is green photons are huge for helping people see disorders and, and microscopic insects in plants. Manufacturers are starting to put information now in their fixtures, but the color rendering index, this is obviously huge for people. And for years we've said, oh, it just doesn't matter for plants. Yeah, it does. I love the Chinese saying, the best fertilizer is the footsteps of the farmer. And if you can't see the plants, your footsteps don't help much. Red photons are the meat and potatoes of the diet, the, the potatoes of the diet. They're very efficient for photosynthesis. The red LEDs are efficient. Many of our, our fixtures now are 80 to 90% red LEDs, both because they're electrically efficient and, and quickly absorbed by the plants. And then far red photons, which are photosynthetic, do the opposite of blue. These inhibit, these enhance. So we can play with those two colors of light to shape plants, tall, short, fat, thin, wide, it's a, it's a wonderful time to be uh, doing research on this to optimize
colors and plant shape. Now I want to switch to amount of light. This is an amazing story with cannabis. No other crop benefits from the high light the way cannabis does. And what this graph shows you is daily light integral. This is the amount of light per day and yield up here. Other crops would look like that. They would saturate at a much lower level of light. Cannabis keeps growing. We've done this many times. This requires whole rooms with whole communities of plants to do this. But our data, coupled now with that of some other labs, indicate we can push cannabis hard with high light. Let me give you a sense of how high this is. On the brightest days in the summer, sunny days, no clouds, we can get up to 60 right here. So we've exceeded a full sunny day in the summer. And this is near the summer solstice. The average in the field is more like 40 or 50. This would be a field average in full sunlight somewhere down here, especially toward the end of the year. In a greenhouse that blocks half of the light, the average is down here. I'm going to put green, GH, greenhouse, which is about 30, and that's with no supplemental light, but grown in the summer. And of course, in the winter, we're down here, in indoors, um, less than 10. Moral of the story, wow, here is a crop we can push with uh, high light and push hard. Interestingly enough, in this data, let's, let's erase those lines. In this data, we, we measured harvest index. Now, this is the ratio of flower yield to total biomass. As the light went up, harvest index also went up. Guess what? In our major crop plants, corn, soybeans, well, not so much soybeans, but high yielding crops, corn, the harvest index is down in here, in, in this zone. So cannabis is quite remarkable. A, a real high ratio of flowers to total weight, and that went up with light. Here's what the plants look like. At low light, not surprisingly, spindly, small flowers. We increased the light. Boy, these were just short and compact and huge colas on these plants once we get up to 70. This is work done by Witch, Mitch Westmoreland, who is a current PhD student in the lab. If you are measuring lights, a daily light integral, the total photons in the day of 70 would be 1,600 micromoles per meter squared per second at a 12 hour photo period. This number right here we call the PPFD, photosynthetic photon flux density. This is what we measure. That's amazing. That's 80% of full sunlight the whole time when these plants are in here. This is just stunning. No other crop is like this, at least none that we have studied. Now, I will say this is with high CO2. All of our work is done with high CO2 because it's immediately economically feasible and important to elevate the CO2. So that is not limiting in here. What did this do to quality when we pushed the plants this hard? You might think the quality would go down. It did not. Yield went up. Here is CBD 15% flat line for over this whole DLI up to 70. Didn't go up, didn't go down. Stayed the same. Here's THC. Also a flat line, very slightly up. Now, if you're an astute watcher, what's the US legal limit for hemp for low THC? 0.03%. There's the legal limit right there. These plants exceed the legal limit. We're pushing them hard. We do not sell hemp. We destroy all the hemp, and so our license lets us get up to above 0.3. Um, but 
and of course, you've got to be real careful not to uh, exceed 0.3 for a medical hemp. But this is an example of what happens when we push the, the lights hard. Now, CBG is the precursor to both of these. If I do arrows on here, this is the precursor to both of these. Wow, look at that. It increased like 40% with highlight. So these plants are making a lot of cannabinoids. This is the ratio, CBD to THC, which we pay attention to a lot. We want the THC to be low, so it's legal. We want the CBD to be high. Lots of people make all kinds of claims about this ratio, but this line is really pretty flat. And right at about 25 to one, CBD to THC. Here's what the flowers look like. Boy, dense colas at high light and at low light, pretty spindly colas. Yeah, it looks like I'm uh, 25 minutes. Let's take a look at a, a couple other amazing things that are re relevant to the field. We have been doing a series of studies on degree days in cannabis. Now we use degree days in lots of horticultural crops. It's just the temperature multiplied by the number of days. So one hot day is equal to two cold days. That's the concept. And we take temperature times time and we call it degree days and that concept predicts the rate of development, time to flowering in a lot of our horticultural crops. What does it do in cannabis? So we recently completed a study. When I say we, this means Mitch Westmoreland. He did the work. Um, wildly different temperatures, really pretty warm down to really cold. These are in Celsius. This is, oh, in the 80s and down into the 50s in Fahrenheit, a huge range of temperatures, and all the data fit one curve. The <coughs> rate of development, meaning flower mass, is on a steady curve predicted by thermal time, also called degree days. This is uh, quite remarkable that regardless of the extremes of temperature, if we add up degree days, we can predict rate of development of the crop. This, by the way, was all done at a 12-hour photo period. This is going to interact with photo period, too. But in a controlled environment, we can set the photo period to 12 hours. Phosphorus. This is huge. Cannabis growers are famous for over-fertilizing with phosphorus. For those of us studying nutrition at universities, we have long encouraged field growers to put on less phosphorus because it's a horrible environmental pollutant. And it's universally people put on more phosphorus than they need. Le runoff causes it to end up in le lakes and rivers and algal blooms. It's a bad story. Now we bring in cannabis growers. We have seen cannabis growers put an order of magnitude more phosphorus on cannabis than you would for any other crop. So we started studying this, uh, many series of studies. This is in liquid fertilizer now, not in a, in a field rate. But most of our crops in here are grown with phosphorus in, in this range. I'm going to put optimal here. And this includes dozens and dozens of crops. Down in here is optimal. We have found cannabis does indeed respond to more phosphorus, but only from about 15 ppm to 30. Now, we don't have data down here, but 30 ppm is beneficial to phosphorus. Going higher than that had no value. This is a non-significant slope of the line. It looks like it slopes down, but it's really statistically flat. We have not seen a value of these incredibly high phosphorus levels. And really, we're waiting for people to announce, the growers to announce that they grow sustainable phosphorus, the sustainable cannabis, not over-fertilized. 
with uh, phosphorus. This is tricky business, though, because there are some cultivars that appear to have benefit from higher phosphorus. Not, it's not the norm, but there's some cultivars. And in those cultivars, let me see, let's put that in red. This line slopes slightly up, um, but the majority are a flat line. We're still studying this. Let me show you what we know, since I've got a, a, a minute here to show you. Here's a, here's a plant. Let's see, we're going to make this simple. We're going to put one leaf up here, and then we're going to have the flower bud right here. Very simple plant. In the later stages of development, phosphorus, shown here in red, moves out of the leaves into the flower. Even though there's ample P in here, when we track this over time, the flowers are cannibalizing the leaves for phosphorus. And you think, well, okay, if the flower needs a lot of phosphorus, this is a good thing. But these levels in the leaves get to be 1% phosphorus or more, way more than could ever be used. The optimum in the leaves is about 0.3%. And the leaves are doing all the work. They're full of enzymes, they're full of nucleic acids, they need a lot of phosphorus. The flowers sh shouldn't need any more than 0.3%, uh, but they accumulate massive amounts of phosphorus. We think what's happening is plants that grow seeds supply their seeds with very high phosphorus to give them a good start in life. The seeds are packed with phosphorus, so they germinate and they have adequate phosphorus when they're a young seedling. Here we go with cannabis, Fem feminized plants, no seeds, the plant still panics and moves phosphorus into this flower. And it's, it's useless phosphorus, but if it's cannibalizing the leaves, it reduces yield. But these super high levels are not beneficial, and here's the amount of P. You give them an optimal level, and there's minimal leaching and tremendous leaching. Um, e both from the field and from indoor cultivation from this. And I think if we extrapolate to the field from this, I think we could roughly put pounds per acre. If you're listening in the United States and you're still using our ancient units of pounds and acres, but this is roughly similar to kilograms per hectare, um, don't over-fertilize with phosphorus, please. One final topic, silicon, SI. Not an essential element, but generally abundant in field soils. Now we go to a greenhouse and we are in a container. We, we, we rock wall, peat-based media, coconut choir, perlite, a lot of things. None of them have adequate silica for the plants. And as a rule of thumb, silicon dioxide is glass. So soluble silica goes into the plants and really strengthens cell walls. We, we know this from many years of study. One of the huge things it does is disease resistance. You can almost eliminate powdery mildew with ample silica in the root zone. We've seen it multiple times. Growers had an outbreak of powdery mildew, and you say, what's going on? Well, it turns out their silicon injector broke, and it stopped, and the disease came back. Um, it helps with, um, we got biotic stress, abiotic stress, helps them make the plants more tolerant of certain insects, mitigates heavy metal toxicity. We're always worried about that. We want the medical hemp to be clean, clean, clean. Silica helps with that. Um, stress tolerance. Now, let me show you an amazing picture. This is from Jonathan France, who is a PhD student in this lab some years ago. This is the reference. You can uh, pause on this. Boom. This happens to be with zinnia. I don't have a picture with, with this with cannabis, but cannabis got a lot of trichomes. Look at this. Silica, this thing is like a rhinoceros. Um, without silica, 
it's susceptible to disease and insects. So when we grow in a soilless media, we want to be adding silica to that media to help the plants be rugged like they are in the field. Now remember where the cannabinoids are? If I, if I drew a little picture here, they're in trichomes. And what are those trichomes made out of? Silica. So cannabis in particular benefits from ample silica in the uh, root zone. The trichomes get tougher as well. We silica is hard to add. It's not very soluble. Um, we recently have a paper on how to get it in liquid fertilizer systems um, with an injector so you can put it in liquid fertilizer. But we have found, building on the work of other laboratories, that wollastonite, a natural mineral, is a tremendous source of silica. Just ground wollastonite. Here's the mineral, ground it, grind it up, it's calcium silicate. And this goes into solution as calcium, and this is silicic acid. This is bioavailable silica, and wollastonite is slow release. Look at this, peat, perlite, coconut choir, vermiculite, there's hardly any silica down here, there's, there's wollastonite. This is Vansil W10, this is a brand name of an American wollastonite mined in uh, New York. Um, and it's, it's sold for horticulture uses like this, but, and this is, look at it, 160 days, it was still releasing silica. This is a wonderful product. We put it in our media at, actually the, the brand name we use is Van Cell 10. We put it in our media at one gram per liter. I, I know that's metric, units, but you can convert to whatever other um, numbers you want. There's the, there's the low rate here. One final slide. This is our campus. Cornell, I was th there again last fall, is a beautiful campus. So are we. And this is the Wellsville Mountains right here. My house is right over in here in this picture. Um, um, if you're interested in cannabis, I invite you to uh, come here to graduate school. Uh, we're, we love collaborating with people. Um, this is a fascinating crop with an exciting future. And in some ways, we're using controlled environments to predict plant responses to the environment that, and we're using cannabis as a model crop for this. Thanks for listening. I, now I'll look forward to your questions. I can think, I, I believe I can speak for everyone that uh, Dr. Bugby always gives a mind blowing uh, presentation and today was no different whatsoever. Um, so thank you for that. that. That got my creativity and curiosity going on so many different levels. Um, so I see a ton of questions in the chat. I think George and Tony are going to try to field those to Bruce. We, and by the way, we should be back live, right? Yep, That's we can hear you loud and clear. Yep. Uh, all right. And you, uh, so our first question is from Angela Goodwin. Uh, she asks, what is the definition of medical hemp versus hemp? Does the term involve the proposed use such as CBD oil? There, this is more of a economic distinction than a botanical distinction. But historically, when we've said hemp, we mean growing it for rope and, and, and well, mostly growing it for rope. Uh, if you look in the literature, there's, there's ads by the federal government, the Navy needs the rope, grow hemp. For, to make hemp for the Navy. This was like before World War II. And it was a huge campaign to grow a lot of hemp nationwide because the fibers, cotton fibers are like three inches long. Hemp fibers are like, they could be three feet long. I mean, that's why it makes such rugged clothing and rugged material. Honestly, I think hemp has a huge future. 
And I think we're going to see hemp gradually start to replace cotton for clothes. Um, has deeper roots than cotton. I think it can be more water use efficient. That's another matter. But, but when we say hemp, we think of rope historically. So then we start calling it medical hemp, which, God, that started to be illegal before World War II. And everything shut down and we went through decades of this is terrible stuff, nobody should be growing it. Well, then guess what? We got DuPont polyester. We didn't need hemp for rope so much anymore. But the distinction then we say medical hemp because of its end use. It's not botanical, it's the end use for CBD and other cannabinoid products. Botanically, again, they're both cannabis sativa. We have lines, and, and Cornell is a leader in studying this, that really make good fiber, that'll make good clothes. God, we're putting it in concrete now instead of rebar. Man, what a wonderful time. They've been botanical products to build houses. That's all hemp with the historical term. When we say medical, that means we're going to use it for pharmaceuticals, and we our breeding programs head in a different direction. We don't care if it makes fiber anymore. We want to focus on the medical part of it. I have to look to the side because that's where I got the screen. So. All righty, we have a, a question from uh, Ana Maria. Have you studied the effect of far red light on cannabinoid production and or flower size? Yes, we have. And, and we, I talked a lot about far red light in photosynthesis, um, but I also said it's like a blowtorch. When you take a plant science course, and especially maybe a plant physiology course, you learn that far red light is very enriched in shade underneath the tree. And what happens to plants when they grow in the shade? I, I can draw it right here. Let's see if I got my screen. Here's a tree. Here's the shade. These plants get tall fast because of enriched far red light. So now experimentally, we give them more far red and, the, and most plants panic. They think they're in the shade and they get real tall. And that's almost always a bad thing. Um, we can give far red light to lettuce and it, and it just keeps getting bigger horizontally. Um, so we have to use far red light very carefully um, it doesn't have a direct effect on cannabinoids. Uh, it has mostly effect on plant shape. And, and so we'd, what we'd like to do is have a nice compact plant over here. And we have to be careful not to get use too much far red and get the plants too tall. Alrighty, our next question is from Felix Akins. What is your experience with photo damage or photo inhibition in cannabis? Make my line slightly smaller here. Um, cannabis has less photo inhibition than many other crops, which is why we could do that. Remember how I had that graph and the, the amount of light is here and the, and the yield is like this. This is the danger zone up here where we get so much light, it's too much and it starts burning leaves and it causes a problem. But Cannabis apparently has sufficient photoprotective pigments that we can push it hard with light and, and get higher yields. Keep in mind now that this is under electric lights, which we don't give them very much UV light. In the sun, they get a lot of UV. The sunlight, sunlight has something like 8% UV. And electrically, we can just take that out. We just don't give many UV. So all of a sudden, it could be damaging in sunlight to go this high. But if we give them the equivalent of sunlight without the UV, um, we can push them harder. It's a big, it's a big topic because there was an early paper um, it, by Leiden, L-Y-D-O-N, Leiden et al. And they, it was 50, not 50, 40 years ago, but they studied high UV and cannabinoids, and they were only doing leaves and, they're, and they're, they got really low levels. But in one of their lines, high UV increased cannabinoid production. Um, but in the other line, it didn't do anything. And 
So they, they concluded in their paper, the effect of UV on cannabinoids is not certain, but everybody says, well, the Leiden paper proved it helps. So, so there's a case of, you gotta read the paper to be good, have good scholarship. Alrighty, this is a kind of related question from Erica Hernandez. Has a saturation point been found for PPFD versus growth? What is required to determine the point of diminishing returns monetarily for added supplementary, added supplemental or sole life light source? So I guess I can draw that graph again. Here's the increasing light, but now we could put a dollar sign here for the cost of that light. If, if we're doing it with supplemental and we can put a dollar sign over here for yield and Clearly this line, if it was exactly like that, it wouldn't matter, but it's not exactly like that. It starts here and it goes like this. So the, the economic optimum is really something more like that. It's a curved line. And economically, some point in the middle is an economic optimum. Again, because here you gotta pay the electric bill. And in the sun, we get up in this part of the curve for free in the, in the summer. This is part of the reason cannabis is just such a vigorous plant. It, it just grows enormously, grows big in the field. Alrighty, a couple of people asked about um, what concentration do you think is high CO2? Do you start the CO2 high or do you increase it as the plants get larger? Yeah, well, if you ever take a class from me, you know I'm constantly drawing X, Y plots. So now we do the same thing. Here's CO2, that's a C. Here's 400, which is what we get for free outside. And let's go all the way up here to 2000. Now these units are parts per million. So way high, five, five times higher than the field. And here's photosynthesis, P net we'll put right here. So there's some point in here where it gets to zero. Um, and then this curve looks like that. And right about here, in fact, this proud curve is probably something like this. 1200 is, is pretty much the saturation point. Uh, this depends a little bit on temperature, um, but so, but enriching from 400 to 1200. Look, I've, I've I've roughly drawn this, but look at this. This is a huge increase um, in photosynthesis and growth and biomass production by elevating CO2, which is one of the keys of indoor agriculture is to realize this big increase. Uh, now, one other thing, if you don't elevate in CO2, this graph goes the other direction. Plants take CO2 out of the air and the, the room drops below 400. You'd just be amazed. I've seen rooms regularly go to 200 and wow, it, it, not doing anything is bad news because they suffocate. I mean, it's like having people in a closed box, they run out of oxygen. So if you don't enrich, you're going this direction. And if you do enrich, you're going that direction. Great. Uh, we have another question. How important is it to change the temperature during the day and the night? Is it recommended to set up one single temperature for indoor growing all the time? Or would it be better to set up a lower temperature during the dark period? Good, good question. Historically, with research on other crops, tomatoes, lettuce, cucumbers, we always give a cooler night. Um, but that's to save money. We don't have to heat the greenhouse so much at night. And cannabis is so high value that that extra heat is not a big consideration. We have not found any advantage of a cooler night temperature. The plant is generally averaging the temperatures. So we typically have a constant temperature day and night. Now we're still researching this. Um, there's disease issues, there's condensation at night. There's a lot of interacting factors, but just from the straight physiology, 
we haven't found any value of having a warmer day and a cooler night. That's, that's the quick answer. So. Uh, another question, uh, curious about phosphorus partitioning. Do other field crops cannibalize pea to floral parts pre-seed? Yeah, another good question. Yes. All plants try to give their seeds a good start in life. And it, so they pack the phosphorus into the seeds during the final weeks of maturity. So those little seeds have a, a bag lunch. They have a lot of phosphorus to start. And this is all a good thing for vigorous seeds. Uh, and so all plants do this, but cannabis is unique. First of all, with field crops, there's only so much a seed can hold. But now we go to cannabis with a big clump of flower and no seeds, and the plant, we call it panicking. It's still thinking, oh my God, I got to move flowers up there, phosphorus up there for the seeds, but there aren't any seeds. So it, it, to us, it looks like it overcompensates. Um, that's something you can help us with in breeding. So we don't keep the plant from panicking about this phosphorus at the end. But all of our data suggests it's cannibalizing the leaves for no, for no uh, gain. And it's why we end up having to put more phosphorus on. Great. Uh, can you comment on the use of silica in soil media cultivation practices and if it is compatible with USDA organic certification? Yeah, I'm not super familiar with all the organic certifications, but wollastonite is a mineral. And I've got to think that's pretty safe. It's just a ground up mineral. We put on rock phosphate all the time. That's a, that's a legal thing. So I would expect a ground up mineral like wollastonite would be compatible with uh, organic certifications. And it, it might, that might be well known. I just haven't looked at it. I know a lot of people are starting to use it. Um, question about do does ideal PPFD for environmental conditions change in the last few weeks before harvesting? Yeah, this is another really interesting question, and we get into the astute observations of historic cannabis growers. We call them the heritage growers. They were growing it before it was legal, and they don't necessarily have any background in the principles of plant science, but they're keen observers. And they've done all kinds of things with light. One of the things is put the plants in the dark for a few days prior to harvest. Um, that's very unusual. I mean, photosynthesis stops. Um, if, if there's anything going on with that, it's an indirect effect. On the, conversely, giving them ample light toward the end you could make a case for that because now photosynthesis is high right before harvest. It could help quality of the crops, but the leaves are old and tired by that time. So we, it's like putting a grandpa on steroids so he can run the hundred yard dash fast. Well, steroids help, but would they help that grandpa? Well, maybe he should have got them earlier in the life cycle. So. It's interesting to add light when a plant is sort of in the senescence phase, but some people argue for doing it. Great. Uh, another question, have you looked at any other cannabinoids for indoor growth, like barren cannabinoids? Like what kind of can cannabinoids? Uh, barren cannabinoids. We've, yeah, we haven't done a ton of studies on minor cannabinoids. Keep in mind here, um, CBG goes to THC, CBD, and CBC. This is real minor. This is a teeny arrow. These are great big arrows here. And then these in turn go to other things in the, in the biochemistry. These two here are 90% of the total cannabinoids in plants. So these the other things that come out of this, 
uh, from other biochemical pathways are real interesting. Pharmaceutically, trace amounts of CBN uh, can be pharmaceutically important. We have not yet done much looking at manipulating the minor cannabinoids. It's something we're e eager to get going on, but we focus mostly on the, these two right here. I think that answers the, is the question. We have a, a couple questions about other, um, other potentially limiting nutrients such as uh, calcium or potassium. Could you comment on that? Yeah, boy, that what a, you guys are really asking good questions. In, in all of plant physiology, all of us teach, potassium is actively taken up and plants will accumulate huge amounts of potassium. Calcium is passively taken up and, and we have a hard time getting enough calcium into many crop plants. To, but in uh, lettuce, lack of calcium is tip burn. In tomatoes, lack of calcium is blossom end rot. We have a whole long list of serious disorders from low calcium. Now we bring in cannabis and it turns the world upside down. In all of our studies with hydroponics, cannabis accumulates calcium as if it was actively absorbed. I mean, calcium is adequate at one or 2% in leaves. We've seen cannabis leaves at 8% calcium. It's amazing doesn't seem to be toxic, but this is just an amazing, and it depletes the solution of calcium. So do we need to give it more or is it, I, I think not. We, we keep giving it more, it can't, can't control its appetite for calcium. Conversely, potassium is slowly absorbed by cannabis. What a fascinating thing from a plant physiology standpoint in terms of its ratio of taking up nutrients but we, it sure takes up calcium fast and we don't have any of the standard calcium deficiencies in cannabis that we do in all kinds of other horticultural crops. Alrighty, we're, we're getting to our, our 3 p.m. Eastern time here. So we'll have one last question. Um, would it be beneficial to grow hemp under 24 hours of light? Got it. Another great question. We'd probably go on for hours with these questions. First of all, it's a short day crop. So we need short days to get it to flower. If we just did 24 hours all the time, we'd get a massive crop and no flowers. So we need short days to get it flower. Now, do we need exactly 12 hours or can we go 13? Could we go 14? And it depends on the cultivar. And now we're going to work with breeders like everybody at Cornell and the USDA to develop lines that can take longer photo periods. If we give the plants 24 hours of light late in the life cycle, we have seen them revert. Instead of growing more flowers, they start to grow more leaves. So the quick answer to this is no, we can't. We can't grow it in 24 hours of light. It's too bad because we could get the daily light integral really high with continuous light, but the plant reverts to growing leaves again. Already, well, I, I think we're at our, our end time here. So I'll, I'll thank uh, Dr. Bugby again for a, a fantastic talk and thank you all for attending for all the um, fantastic questions. Uh, just a reminder in two weeks at the same time, we'll have Dr. Heather Grab talking about uh, hemp processing systems. And uh, this video will be posted on YouTube uh, if you'd like to watch it again. Thank you all. Thanks again, Bruce. Yes, thanks for putting this together. Nice job. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.